Okay, so uh, yeah, so, so now we have Alex May from UBC. We'll be talking about quantum tasks and holography. Okay, great. Well, hi, everybody. And uh, I'd just like to start by saying thank you to the conference organizers for the invitation to speak today. It's a wonderful opportunity. So the subject I'll be talking about is something I'm calling quantum tasks and holography. And this is based on uh, some recent work over the last two years, I guess, it, that's appeared in these three papers, one of which is yet to appear. Um, <clears throat> so the, the first work was, came from early last year, which was by myself. And then those ideas were taken up and much improved in a uh, very nice collaboration with John Soros and Jeff Pennington. And I'll also have uh, a chance, I think, at the end to mention some ideas uh, that will appear in an upcoming paper in collaboration with David Wakeham. David is the, a uh, fellow graduate student at UBC with me. And uh, I'll, I'll make one comment that this is not quite the advertised talk that appeared in my abstract. I had a last minute change of heart and decided to uh, give a bit of a broader talk than I originally uh, said. Okay, so I'll, I'll jump in. So we, we all know at this point that quantum information plays a significant role in quantum gravity. And there's lots of examples of this from the Rio Taganaki formula to the role that error correction plays in ADS CFT and many other topics. Um, but something I wanna emphasize today is that the usual sort of treatment of quantum information doesn't really consider how quantum information can be processed in a space-time context. Okay, so if you open up your favorite textbook on quantum information theory, uh, you're unlikely to find a space-time diagram. And I think the, the main takeaway I wanna try and give you today is that by thinking about quantum information in a uniquely space-time setting, there are new insights to be had and in particular new insights into ADS-CFT uh, to be had. Okay, so the, the outline for the talk today is I'm gonna introduce a framework for thinking about quantum information processing in a space-time setting. And that'll lead me to this idea of a quantum task. Okay. And then uh, in the second part, I'll discuss how we can relate this idea to ADS CFT and how we can use results from quantum tasks in that setting. And I'll try and outline uh, some of the results that we can obtain that way. The main thing that I will uh, come to there is that thinking about quantum information theory in this way is uh, brings us to an insight that causal features of bulk geometry are related to entanglement. Okay. And I think that this is a qualitatively different connection than the usual entanglement geometry connection. And that usually we re relate entanglement and uh, space-like surfaces. Okay. Then at the end of the talk, uh, time permitting, I'll give a collection of assorted thoughts that I, I wanted to tell you about and I, I'm excited about um, but which didn't quite fit naturally into the rest of the talk. Also, I got a notification that my internet connection is unstable. So if I cut out, um, let me know and I'll turn off my video or, or something. Okay, so uh, let's start with this idea of, of quantum tasks. So what is a quantum task? Well, it's just a quantum computation, um, but one that has a little bit of additional structure added in in that the inputs and outputs to the computation will occur at specified space-time locations. So, okay, and I'll describe those in more detail. Um, to talk about them, it will be useful to use a operational sort of language. So we're gonna introduce two agencies, Alice and Bob. Alice will be the person receiving inputs and producing outputs. Bob will be the person who gives Alice the inputs and then verifies her outputs. Okay, so here's a very simple example of a quantum task. Here we have um, a space-time point C1 at which Bob will give Alice some quantum system A. And then Alice's job or her task is to then return quantum system A at uh, a point R1. Okay, so that, that's the task, that's very simple. Given an example of a task such as this one or any other, um, we can ask various questions about it. Maybe the most basic question we can ask is with what probability is it possible to complete this task? Okay. Something I wanna highlight about that is that that probability, the success probability depends not only on what we require Alice, 
what we give Alice as inputs and require as outputs, but also on the space-time location of those inputs and outputs. So here, um, I've placed the, the point R, the output point, at in the future light cone of C. And so the success probability um, would be high, because Alice can just take A and bring it to, to R1. But on the other hand, if I put R down here, then the, I would expect the success probability to be low, right? Because it's outside the future light cone now. OK. Um, maybe a bit of a more fine-grained question we can ask is, given that we require Alice to be able to complete the task with some probability, so we say this is bigger than alpha, we can ask what that tells us about the resources Alice must have. OK, so in some instances, um, completing the task with high probability might require that Alice have entanglement between two space-time locations, for example. And we'll see um, instance of that, instances of that come up in a moment. OK, so here's a uh, somewhat more um, rich example of a task where uh, it's called a, it's an instance of what's called a summoning task. Um, those are a, a class of tasks that have been studied in, in some detail, for instance, by me and Patrick, as well as others. Um, this task. Uh, yeah. Actually, Ming Bao had a question. What is the interpretation in ADSCFT of a task being operationally impossible? Uh, I think I will save that question for later. Okay, all right, sure. No. Yeah. Also, I wanted to apologize. I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, I thought oh, that the oh, I thought okay. that, like the chat was a thing where you could drop. Oh, all right, all right, all right. Fine, fine. I'll just. Yeah. No problem. We'll we'll talk more later, Ning. Um, okay. So so this is a. I'm just trying to flesh out what tasks are. I'm going to give you a richer example. So here's one with um, four points now. So there's two inputs and two outputs. So there's these inputs C1, C2, and outputs R1 and R2. And I've placed them in two plus one dimensional Minkowski space. And I've placed them such that um, they have certain causal relations between them. So in particular, R1 and R2 are in the future of C1, as well as in the future of C2. I've also placed them such that uh, there does not exist a point P such that uh, P is in the past of R1 and R2, and then in the future of C1 and C2. OK, Th that's the causal setup of this task. What are the inputs and outputs? Um, at C1, Alice is going to get a quantum state, psi. And at C2, she'll get a bit, B, which is going to be either 1 or 2. And uh, what she's supposed to output is the state psi at the output labeled by B. OK, so if B is 1, then she should bring psi uh, here. OK, so, so that's the task. Now, let's think a little bit about how you can try and do this. OK, and we'll start by thinking about just a naive strategy. The naive strategy is just to take psi and to send it somewhere. Okay, it's supposed to end up at R1 or R2, so we're just going to try and send it to the right place. Um, in, in that case, you end up with a bit of a problem, right? So you have psi over here, and it needs to go to one of the Rs, and which R is fixed by this information B over here. But B is, is far away from psi, and so Alice is forced to guess if she should send psi to R1 or to R2. And she'll only guess right with probability half. Right. So this naive strategy has a success probability of one half. OK, now that's not the only strategy available, so she can do something a bit more subtle. In particular, there is a strategy that completes this with probability one that exploits the quantum teleportation protocol. OK, so the way that that works is Alice shares an EPR pair between C1 and C2. And then when she receives psi, she measures psi and the EPR pair um, in the Bell basis and gets out some classical measurement outcome. This partly solves her problem because the outcome J is classical. And so she can send it to both R1 and R2, right? She's no longer faced with this, this dilemma. 
at the same time, after she measures, the state over here is now uh, some poly acting on psi. And so that's a, that's a quantum system. She has to decide where to send it. But now that quantum system is held in the same place as B that tells her where it needs to go. So if B say is one, then she can take this up here. She has P, J, Psi and J and she can recover Psi. Okay. And that solves the task for her. So the reason I'm, I'm presenting this in some detail is that I want to emphasize that this task sort of highlights an interesting feature of quantum teleportation, which is that it lets you solve this coordination problem. So this, this coordination problem where you're trying to figure out where psi should go and you have to send it somewhere based on B and B is outside your light cone. So you can sort of exploit B using teleportation in, in this way. So it highlights something about teleportation um, that isn't really apparent outside of a, a space-time context. And so the bigger point here is that these quantum tasks uh, capture space-time specific aspects of quantum information. Okay. Okay. Um, so now I want to talk about how we can apply this sort of thinking or these sort of tasks in holography. Okay. So here's the basic strategy we're going to follow. We're going to think of one of these tasks, call it T, and we'll place it in the bulk. We'll define a, a task in the bulk. And then we're going to try and identify some dual corresponding task, call it T hat, in the boundary. Okay. And I'll talk in a moment about how to make this identification. And then the second step is we'll notice or, or assert at least that since the boundary describes the bulk physics, that the success probability of this corresponding task in the boundary should be lower bounded by the success probability in the bulk. One way to think of that is just, if I have some strategy in the bulk that completes the task with a certain probability, then I can map that through the dictionary to something in the, in the boundary, which will complete it with the same probability. Okay. Um, so then the way I wanna think about this inequality is really as a constraint on the, on the CFT or on the boundary theory. Now, of course, that's not the kind of constraint we usually care about when we talk about CFTs or when we talk about ADS CFT. Um, but, and so the last step that we'll do is to then relate that constraint to one that we care about more. In particular, uh, in the examples I'll show you, we'll be able to turn this lower bound on success probability into a lower bound on entanglement. Okay. So a comment about understanding um, what the corresponding boundary task is for a given bulk task. Um, one thing is that uh, when we pick the bulk task T, we should place the input and output points at the asymptotic boundary. And that's just so that I can identify those points naturally with points in the boundary. And so when I have an input point here in, in T, I can uh, define some task T hat, which will have an input point in the corresponding place in the conformal boundary geometry. Okay, so the, the comment here is just that in order to um, make this identification, we should restrict our attention um, from general tasks T to ones that happen at the boundary. Okay, good. Um, okay, so now, the first example of this kind of thinking at work, um, and the first example of the kind of result that we can get. Um, okay, so I'm going to start by just stating the, the, the theorem that we get out at the end for you, and then I'll explain how this kind of reasoning about tasks uh, gets us to this theorem. So uh, here's the theorem. You pick four points on the boundary of ADS. Okay, so you pick C1, C2, and R1, and R2. And then you check uh, if these points scatter in the bulk. And by scatter in the bulk, I mean that there exists points P in the bulk, which are in the future of C1, future of C2, and past of R1 and R2, okay? If that happens, if this scattering region is non-empty, then 
uh, the theorem claims that the entanglement wedge of two associated regions on the boundary will be connected, okay? So that's these V1 and V2. They'll have a connected wedge, which means the minimal surfaces sit like this. Okay. Uh, so to be somewhat more precise, um, what I mean by these regions here is specifically this intersection of light cones. So I'm gonna call these the input regions and we'll define V1 as the future light cone of C1 intersected with the backward light cone of R1 intersected with the backward light cone of R2, all taken in the boundary geometry. And similarly, V2 is the same, but now with the future light cone of C2. Okay, so that's these gray regions here. Okay, so, so that's the statement of the theorem. Now, let me discuss how we get there. Okay, so we're gonna think about a task. We're gonna think specifically about what I'll call the B84 task. It's a task with two inputs and two outputs. The first input at C1 is a bit, either zero or one. And the second input at C2 is a qubit um, in one of these states. So B is a bit, zero or one, and H is the Hadamard operator. So that means that for Q equals zero, this state is either zero or one. And for Q equals one, this state is either plus or minus. Okay. Um, so those are Alice's inputs. What she's required to return as outputs is the bit B at both R1 and R2. Okay. Uh, so now let's look at this task from the bulk perspective. Okay, so like I suggested we should do, I put the um, input and output points at the boundary here. Um, so here's C1, C2, R, R2, R1. And um, following the conditions of the theorem, I'm gonna focus on the case where this scattering region is not empty. Okay, so there are causal curves that come in and meet up here and then come out again to R1 and R2. Um, so when the scattering region is not empty, something interesting happens from the task's perspective, which is that there's a simple strategy for completing this task in the bulk, right? The simple strategy is what I've illustrated schematically here. So you just take the inputs, Q and, and HQB, into the middle, undo HQ. Now you're just left with this state B. Measure, find out B, and send it to both R1 and R2. Okay, um, that strategy succeeds with probability one. So in the bulk perspective, we have uh, uh, success probability one. Okay, now let's think about the same thing, but from the boundary perspective. So we've identified the corresponding task T hat, and I'm looking at this in the boundary geometry. So I've just unrolled the boundary of the cylinder. Um, these lines are identified. We still have the same, sorry, flip page by accident. Um, we still have the same input and output points and the same inputs, but the crucial change is in the geometry that we are, we're on now. So in particular, um, we can notice that often in the boundary, and in particular in the case I've shown here, uh, the, the scattering region is just empty. Okay. So you can see that it's empty because uh, there's nowhere you can meet in the middle, right? So if I try and meet up between C1 and C2 um, and then get out to R1 and R2, I see that I can actually only reach R1. Or if I meet up between C1 and C2 here, then I can only reach R2 and not R1, okay? So the scattering region is empty. Now, for tasks, that means that this strategy I, I described before, this local strategy where you meet in the middle is not available to you, okay? So if the boundary is gonna do the task, it has to do it in some other way, okay? So schematically over here, we know that it can't do things in the middle. So it can try and do the next best thing, which is to do operations, quantum operations near C2, near C1, exchange a round of communication, and then act near R1 and near R2. 
Um, so the way the way to think about the schematic diagram in terms of the the space time picture is that the operations that happen here, those are things that happen in the future of C1 and in the past of R1 and R2. And so I should identify everything that happens here with things that happen inside this causal diamond here, right? So this is the future light cone of C1 intersected with the backward light cone of R1 or R and R2. In other words, this scattering region V1 that I defined, or this input region V1 that I def defined at the beginning. Okay. Okay, so the boundary doesn't have a scattering region, so it has to use this non-local strategy. Um, okay, so now I wanna compare the, the bulk and boundary perspectives here. So I recall, first of all, that from the bulk perspective, this success probability was one because we have a scattering region. And then I have this inequality that I discussed earlier. And so that tells me that the success probability in the boundary uh, also needs to be one, okay? But in the boundary, we're using this non-local strategy. And a fact about this non-local strategy is that if the success probability is gonna be one, it must be the case that V1 and V2 are entangled, okay? So there has to be an EPR pair here. Otherwise, your success probability is, bo is bounded below one, okay? And so that's the reasoning that leads us to this theorem, right? Because it's saying that when the scattering region is non-empty, um, I can do the task in the bulk with high probability. That means I must be able to do it in the boundary with high probability. That means V1 and V2 are entangled. Um, and so that's what I conclude here. The mutual information is large. Um, and then the mutual information being large uh, via the Ryu Takanaki formula is equivalent to the, the um, minimal surfaces sitting this way and having a connected entanglement wedge. Now, I haven't really argued for you here that the, the mutual information should be order one over G Newton. Um, that's a little bit of a more detailed quantitative argument, but you can ask me about that or, or see the, the paper on this with, with Jeff and John. Okay, so um, that's the first result that we get out of this. Like I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, one reason I think this is interesting is that this is relating causal features of the geometry. So in particular, the existence of this scattering region um, to entanglement in the boundary. And that's a little bit different than the usual um, entanglement geometry connection. Okay, good. So uh, now the second example. So this is based on upcoming work with David. And uh, it's similar to the last one, but in a bit of a different setting. Okay, so the setting now is uh, asymptotically ADS space, but in two plus one bulk dimensions, uh, but that now ends on some dynamical object in the bulk, which is this end of the world brain. Okay, uh, so we still have an ADS boundary. Now the space time also ends on the, on the brain. And I also will just introduce some language and say that where the brain meets the boundary, I will call the edge. Okay, so this is the edge. Okay, so space times like this have a uh, proposed holographic dual description. Um, so let me describe that. So here's, here's a time slice of the picture I was just showing. We have our ADS space. It ends on some end of the world brain. We have this ADS boundary region. Um, and then where the brain meets the boundary, we have the edge. The, the um, boundary description of this is supposed to be a CFT that lives on the ADS boundary and with a, uh, with a boundary condition fixed at the edge. Okay, so this defines a BCFT or boundary conformal field theory. Now, we, we don't really need to know anything about BCFTs except that the Ryu Takanaki formula still holds. So if I wanna calculate the entanglement entropy of some region V here, I can do that by looking at RT surfaces um, surfaces homologous to V. The slight change is that now there's sort of a different way to satisfy the homology constraint, which is that um, I can have surfaces that end on the brain like this. So this would be considered homologous to V and is a candidate surface. Okay. Um, 
So in this setting, we can think about tasks, tasks again, and we get to a, a, a similar theorem. Um, the task that we think about is a little bit different. So we now just have one input point and two outputs, R1 and R2. And I'm going to specify that the outputs occur at the edge. OK. The, I've removed one of the inputs that used to input Q. And I'm instead going to encode Q into the brain degrees of freedom. OK, so Q just lives on the brain somehow. OK, um, so that's sort of the task set up. I need to define some, some causal regions again. And specifically, I'm going to be interested in a scattering region, which will now be the future light cone of C1 intersected with the backward light cone of R1 and backward light cone of R2. But I'm going to restrict my attention to the part of that that lives on the brain. Okay, So that would be like in this picture, this point here. And then uh, in the boundary, I'll be interested in this input region. There's only one of them now which is the future light cone of C1 intersected with the backward light cone of R1 and R2. So that would sit something like, uh, something like this here. Okay. Okay. So the theorem that this leads us to is the following. So it says that if the scattering region is non-empty, this brain anchored scattering region now, then the entanglement wedge of V attaches to the brain. Okay, so here's V here, and then I'm saying that when, when scattering like this happens, the minimal surfaces will sit this way. Okay. The way to think about why this is true from this task's perspective is um, basically this task in the bulk can be completed with high probability when there's a scattering region, just because we go to the brain, learn Q, um, undo HQ, measure, find out B, send it out. And then from the boundary perspective, what you can show is that for the boundary to complete the same task with high probability, the bit Q needs to be known inside of the region V. And since Q is stored in the brain, that means that the entanglement wedge or the portion of the bulk that V sees needs to connect to the brain so that it, it learns Q. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so that's the theorem. Oh, I should also say this theorem, as well as the last one, uh, you can both prove um, just in general relativity. So you can think about this from the perspective of entanglement, or you can just say this is a relationship between light cones and minimal surfaces. Then it's just a geometric statement, and you can hope to prove it just in GR. And indeed, um, in collaboration with Jeff and John, that's what we were able to, we were able to do that. Um, OK, yeah. So this theorem, I think, is interesting maybe for two reasons. One, it extends this connection between causal features of the geometry and entanglement into a bit of a new setting. Um, but two, this particular setting has been of a lot of interest recently in that um, this phase transition from, from minimal surfaces that sit like this to ones that are anchored on the brain um, is a model for this island formation phenomena. So from the perspective of physics on the brain, this region here um, is an island, right? And so one thing that I'm thinking about right now with David uh, is that this causal perspective on entanglement should be able to be brought to bear on this uh, islands phenomena. And we should be able to make some uh, causal condition for when an island forms. And uh, preliminarily, what seems to happen is that when there's a causal curve from inside this black hole on the brain out to V, uh, which we identify as the radiation system, um, then that's when an island forms, or the, the theorem tells you that that's when an island forms. And so we get this interesting causal um, explanation or reason for, for why an island is, is appearing. OK. So I'll, I'll be brief on that, but uh, questions are welcome. All right, so that, that's the main part of the talk. Um, let me just conclude with a few scattered thoughts. Okay. Okay. So the first thought is a relationship to what I've been talking about today 
and a topic in uh, cryptography actually called position-based cryptography. So in position-based cryptography, what happens is Bob tries to verify Alice's location in space-time, okay? So um, what he does is set up a quantum task, which he hopes will force Alice to do operations within some space-time region R. Okay, so here's R. Here's this task. It has some general inputs, A1, A2, outputs B1, B2. And then Bob specifies some channel N that Alice is supposed to do. Bob is going to try and pick the channel so that Alice is forced to use this local kind of a strategy and thereby be forced to do operations inside of R. And that, that confirms for Bob that Alice is in R. Okay. On the other hand, Alice may try and cheat. And if she's going to cheat, she, what she'll do is use this non-local strategy. And um, by using the non-local strategy, she can ensure that she acts only outside of R. Right, so her operations all happen outside the space-time region. Okay, so this this is the the tension in in position-based cryptography between Alice and Bob, and this was studied in uh, in detail by uh, cryptographers some some time ago, and they found two things that I think are very interesting. So the first is that they found it's always possible to for, for Alice to cheat. Okay, so it's always possible to replace a channel implemented locally um, with a non-local implementation. So you can achieve the same thing doing this as you can doing this. This, I think, I think is a very interesting result and actually is what originally got me interested in this topic in that this kind of hints at the holographic principle to me or something, somehow holography seems to be coming in here already. Um, and why do I say that? Well, it's just because what it's saying is that I have some, some dynamics that happen inside of a space-time region R, and then the result is that it's always possible to rewrite that dynamics as something that happens um, very close to the boundary of R, right? I can choose to put these operations close to the boundary of R in some very thin region, and now I've, I've rewritten my bulk dynamics as, as boundary dynamics. Um, so, okay, I thought that was very interesting. In particular, because it has this this holography idea in it, but I, I haven't mentioned gravity or black holes or anything like that, so it seems to be coming from a very dis different perspective than the than the usual one. Okay. Um, the other thing that they showed, which is interesting, is that to do this rewriting from local to non-local uh, requires entanglement. So you have to have EPR pairs here shared between V1 and, and V2. Um, so we, we actually already used this result in particular in the context of this B84 task where I said entanglement was necessary to have a high success probability. Um, but this is also more general. So you know most channels that I might try and do locally here will require entanglement um, to implement non-locally. So I thought this was also interesting in that we're very quickly seeing some kind of connection between this holographic idea of rewriting things on the boundary and some essential role for entanglement. And of course, that's, um, that's, that's borne out in the, in the ADS CFT correspondence. Okay. Okay, so I just have a few minutes left and I have just one final thought for you. Um, so the final thought is that it seems like taking this perspective on quantum information um, tells us something new about ADS CFT, but it also seems to be the case that the that the reverse is true. So in this context, ADS CFT seems to be able to tell us something novel about quantum information. Um, so here, here's the way to see that. Uh, we'll think about this general quantum task again with uh, inputs A1, A2, outputs B1, B2, and we're gonna have some channel happen N from A to B. And then I'm gonna keep track now of the size of my inputs. So I'm gonna say that N is the number of qubits here, okay? And then I'll ask uh, how many EPR pairs do I need in general to, to write this channel non-locally? Okay, so when the cryptographers showed that you could always do this non-locally, they had some specific construction 
and that construction uh, uses e to the n EPR pairs. Okay, so we have to take k to scale like e to the n. Okay. Now, on the other hand, let's think about this same scenario, but in the context of ADS CFT. So now I've set up this task, but now it's happening in the bulk of ADS, right? So I'm going to do this channel n here in the middle. Um, and then let's let's think about the size of the inputs and the entanglement involved. So I'll take n qubits and then ask, how big can I make n? Now, I'd argue that you can take n to be order 1 over g Newton, since that's how big you have to make it before you start getting back reaction. Right? So there should be no, no um, limitation on n until, until the geometry starts changing. OK, so n is order 1 over g Newton. Now, at the same time, in ADS CFT, we know how to just um, calculate the, the mutual information involved here. So if I looked at these input regions, v1 and v2, and calculated the mutual information, um, then I would find a mutual information of order 1 over g Newton as well. Okay. So then that, uh, that tells me that k is actually linear in n. So the number of EPR pairs I have is just linear. Okay. So what this is saying is that ADS CFT somehow provides an efficient way to do these non-local computations. Okay. And in fact, it, it offers an exponential improvement over the best known constructions. So I think something very interesting to do and something that I'm thinking about um, with a few people, like Kefir Dolev and, and Patrick Hayden, and I think maybe a few others are thinking about it now, um, is you know, how, how can we understand how ADS CFT is doing this and then turn that into some more practical quantum information protocol? Okay. So that's a, a future direction. OK, so that's everything. I'll just summarize. Uh, so I tried to emphasize at the beginning that this quantum tasks framework highlights space-time specific aspects of quantum information, and that taking this perspective on quantum information is relevant to ADS-CFT. In particular, it led to these two theorems I described. And these two theorems relate causal features of the bulk to boundary entanglement. Okay, so there's, um, there's many directions left here to explore, I think, um, more tasks to consider. Uh, there's an interesting story in higher dimensions, which I think is not understood fully. Um, this quantum information question I, I just mentioned and uh, many other things, but I'll stop and say thank you. All right, well, uh, thank you so much. Uh, so, okay, so, so um, um, I just had a, maybe a, a uh, uh, well, one or two questions to get yeah. things started. Uh, um, you know, I mean, so, 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 like, uh, um, would you say that there is a uh, a proof that uh, uh, that the that, that position based cryptography can be attacked using a linear amount of entanglement? Like, like for a a quantum information theorist, like, should you know, if if yeah. there is an argument that comes from ADS CFT. Then you know, should they treat that as a, as, as as a proof? Or yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So I think that's a great question. And so I, there there is logically another possibility here than that. There there's um, linear protocols, right? So the other logical possibility is that you just cannot build a um, a universal quantum computer in the bulk of ADS. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, there are known linear constructions. Mm -hmm. For uh, if the channel is in the Clifford group, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, but if it's somewhere more complicated unitary, then that's when these exponential constructions come in. Okay. And so, a, a logical possibility is that you're only allowed to build computers that do Clifford operations in the bulk of ADS, okay. and and then and then this wouldn't break, you know, position-based cri cryptography, right? Okay. Um, I think so that possibility is unlikely, but. So we should so we should treat it as an excellent plausibility argument. Yeah, and a big step toward a proof, hopefully. But not yeah, that. and I, I think a proof will come when we you know yeah. really manage to construct some some explicit protocol here. And uh, okay, uh, thanks a lot. And I, I was very intrigued by your uh, comment about how uh, um, um, position the, the impossibility of position based cryptography 
is somehow already a uh, uh, a signal of, of of something holographic, right? Now, I guess one problem that I have with that is that, yeah. as I understand it, in a classical world, position-based uh, cryptography would just be trivially attackable, right? That's because true. Yeah. Make copies of the information, so it seems like you know, in in this entangled attack on position-based crypto. We are, you know, uh, entanglement is solving a problem that is only there in the first place because of quantum mechanics. That's true. Yeah, that, that's an interesting point. Um, yeah, I mean, it is it is just a, sort of a heuristic mm -hmm. argument that there's something holographic going on here. I, I think it's it's strengthened by the fact that, you know, you can think about this and think about what this should mean in ADS CFT, and then you arrive at this at this. Um, connected wedge theorem that I described earlier. And so, you know, it does seem like what's going on here is something that's happening in ADS CFT. And, and so I think that supports the intuition that this has something to do with, with holography. But, um, but yeah, I agree that, you know, it's, you only need entanglement because of no cloning really. And then, yeah, well, you know, there could be lots of holographic type things that happen with classical information too, but uh, yeah. Uh, if it's physics or not. But, um, um, anyway, we've got a whole bunch of questions. So I yeah. think Meta uh, was the first to uh, want to ask. Uh, yeah, thank, thank you, Alex, for the really nice talk. Um, I had a question about this scattering that you talked about. Uh, maybe you mentioned this, but I missed it. Um, you said that you're looking at the scattering process, but just because it's causally permitted in the sense of not being space-like separated doesn't mean that you're conserving, that you're able to conserve energy momentum at the vertex and that it's actually a process that can happen. So have you, have you thought at all about whether you can actually carry out this process given that there are constraints on the energy momentum conservation? Like for example, in ADS-3, it's very hard to do this kind of thing. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I don't know. I think though that I the argument from this kind of scattering process that there should be entanglement, um, I don't know if you should really think of it as like a scattering process as I would think of in, in quantum field theory, right? So I, I'm allowed, for instance, to have, you know, some, some small amount of matter sitting here in the bulk, which would be maybe my quantum computer, and uh, it will take in, you know, these, these particles from C1 and C2 do some operation and then send them out again to R1 and R2. But there's allowed to be other, other systems involved. So if you know this, um, if these lines like don't conserve momentum, you could just add some additional particle in that that goes off in some random direction and then. Um, but wouldn't you, wouldn't you end up losing some information that way? Uh, yeah, but that's fine as long as you know as long as it completes this task for you, then you. Mm -hmm. uh, then, okay. then this argument holds. Um, so, so have you thought about whether that's always a possible thing to do, um, given the- not, not in detail, so, uh -huh. no. um, but you know, I'll say that this, this is the argument and then the proof is, is the relativistic one that, um, that, it, that it appears in this paper with John and Jeff that, okay, it doesn't rely on this reasoning about scattering. It just uses the focusing theorem to show that this holds. Um, Right, so, and more for the interpretation. I have no doubt that your, your theorem is correct, given that it's just a right. statement about causal structure. Um, I'm just asking about the interpretation of information. Are you carrying in, uh, these particles coming in and, yeah. and, and leaving? It seems that you have to conserve energy momentum at the vertex. And yeah. just because they're That's causally right. separated doesn't mean that that is necessarily going to happen. Yeah, so I guess I guess what I would say is that my, my, my intuition would be that you can always fix this up by adding some additional particles in, and that doesn't change the argument, um, but I haven't worked that out in detail. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, great. Um, Veronica Hubeny. Hi, Veronica. Hi. Hi. Thanks, Alex, for a great talk. I have a small comment for the on the connected wedge theorem. Yeah. In particular, it, it sounds to me, at least in the setup that you showed, but it sounds like more generally, the one with the end of the world brain is yeah. just uh, sounds like the same theorem or trivial extension of the connected wedge theorem because the extremal surface is always hit, have to hit the brain perpendicularly. And so if yes. you look at the next picture, it's like reflecting, yeah. uh, if you reflect the end of the world brain back, then you get the first theorem. Right? Yeah, so that, that's certainly a way to think about it. So you can think of 
this end of the world brain as coming from like a Z2 identification of a interface right. interface brain. Right. And then you could run the, the relativistic proof of this. Um, you should be able to run in that, in that sort of double geometry. It's a little bit confusing in that um, the relativistic proof is using the null energy condition just because I'm using focusing. Um, but in general, for, uh, for a brain that doesn't have zero tension, um, the transverse component of the null energy condition across that interface brain uh, like will, will be violated. So you, the null energy condition doesn't actually hold in that, in that doubled space time. And so for that reason, I found it more convenient to think about in the sort of single-sided case. Um, so then the way that you prove the theorem is just to assume the null energy condition holds in, in the bulk and then that the stress tensor um, for the brain, so there's some induced stress tensor, then you, you impose the null energy condition on that stress tensor. Um, and, and then with those two conditions, you can, you can show the theorem. Uh, yeah, so, so somehow I think thinking about it in this doubled way is, is fine, but the, you get this funny thing with the, with the transverse component of the neck that um, is a bit awkward. Yeah. Okay, uh, great. Uh, Henry? Yeah, thanks for the really nice talk, Alex. Um, as there seems to be a, a kind of asymmetry between bulk and boundary, the way you were discussing it, I don't know if you could comment on that the, all the tasks you've described doing in the bulk are very simple. It's just some courier delivering you a, a package in a qubit and maybe doing some simple one qubit operation. But on the boundary, you're doing uh, very complicated things, potentially of um, you know decoding what's in the entanglement wedge and so forth. So is that just sort of, a feature of what you're doing. I guess it's maybe related to your last comment, but yeah, um, if you could comment on that kind of difference in the kind of tasks you're allowing, or is are you really allowing, not allowing difficult tasks in the belt? Or uh, no, I mean, okay, that that may partly be an artifact of the fact that you know I've only cons I haven't been thinking about this for that long, so I've only you know started. The tasks I've considered maybe are just happen to be ones that are simple in the bulk, um, but uh, but yeah, I mean I, I don't really know exactly why that's true. It just seems that you know in the bulk you have a what I describe as a, a stronger causal structure. So you know you can meet in the middle and get out again, and then in the boundary you may have a weaker causal structure, and then that seems to require you to do you know. Um, to, to, to come up with more clever protocols in, in the boundary. Um, yeah, but yeah, I, I don't know. I don't really have any great um, insights into why that happens. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, Edgar? Hey, Alex, thanks for the talk. I had a question about your thought one. Um, so I, I can believe that the, the um, Tangma, you were talking about plays an interesting role in holography, but as you said, it didn't involve anything with black holes or gravity. So you could have said this just in quantum field theory. So why then do you think that it's somehow manifesting holography? Because in those systems where it would also be true, there is no holography. Um, well, yeah, I guess I'm, I'm not saying that this is as good of an argument for holography as, you know, black hole arguments. Um, but I guess I'm just saying that, you know, even in, in this simple setting where I don't have gravity, um, I can still make the statement that you can always replace dynamics happening inside a space-time region with stuff happening like near the boundary of the region. And certainly that has some flavor to it of, of holography. Um, yeah, I guess, you know, I'm not making like a, a precise statement there, but um, I, I, you know, I think it's, Somehow in quantum mechanics, there's at least a hint that this holographic idea is, is, uh, is possible. Okay, right. so you, you believe it even in quantum field theory, then that's your statement. There, there, there really wasn't something about gravity or black holes that I missed here. Right? No, right? no, 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 no. Okay. Yeah. Could but, I comment no. on that just briefly? Uh, yes. I was also really puzzled by that because holography is supposed to become trivial when G Newton goes to zero. Uh, but I think that it's really interesting because 
I think it's gravity that's supplying the entanglement resource that you need here. I mean, how do you know that you have such a resource? I think it's the fact that gra when gravity is turned on, you're guaranteed to have it. Uh, I'm wondering if you would agree with that, Alex. Um, I don't know. That's not the way I've, I've thought about it, I guess. But uh, that, that sounds like an interesting and impl implausible statement. So maybe I'll, I'll mull that over. Um, Raphael, did you have another question or was that your question? No, that was actually my okay, question. All right. So all right. Uh, or comment or whatever. All right, awesome. Uh, Ning? Hi, guys. Um, thanks, Alex, for the talk for like the eighth time, but you deserve it. <laughs> right. um, so uh, I, I guess uh, I now have two things to say after okay. Raphael said that. Um, I guess I'll, I'll respond to that first, which is... Uh, I guess in many field theories, if you're talking about physically relevant states, there also is highly non-trivial entanglement, which could also be used as the entanglement resource. So it's unclear that like the entanglement resource necessarily goes away in the limit where uh, you no longer have a gravitational system. But uh, I, I had a question more about like your um, your philosophical outlook on um, on this sort of thing. The, the kind of point that you're making is one that I strongly agree with, which is that if I can't do an operational task in the context of ADS CFT, if like it's just impossible to perform something, then that should tell me something about ADS CFT. It should like translate some sort of no-go theorem from like a quantum channels or quantum info perspective into some sort of statement that's true about the gravity theory. And like, for example, a previous work that um, also kind of had this kind of feel was Harlow Hayden when they talked about like computational complexity and the ability to, and whether or not it was relevant to resolve things like the information paradox. I guess I was wondering if uh, you felt like in your pers from your perspective, you were also kind of elevating this, this uh, I guess, usage of the um, operational interpretation and quantum information into more of a physical principle in the gravity theory? Do, do you feel like there's a, there are other directions that you can see in which that can be a useful mindset? Or do you feel like the task that you did was kind of specialized in this regard? Um, yeah, so I guess, you know, I think that the, the results we've found from doing this so far um, is sort of just one thing like, for, like Veronica was, was pointing out, right? So I think at this point, we kind of have one interesting fact that's come from this. You can apply it in, the, in these different settings. There's, there's some differences between the way you think about it in those two settings, but roughly it's, it's sort of one thing. If there are more interesting statements you can get this way, you know, the way I frame this, obviously I think so, or at least I hope so. Um, you know, I, I, I would like to continue thinking about these tasks and, and um, you know, understanding what else it might tell us. You know, for instance, the one we found here seems to relate to the phase transition in, in the mutual information, or um, basically it sees it sees this, uh, right, so, so this phase transition in the mutual information, you know, maybe another thing would be, there's a, there's a somewhat different phase transition that comes up when you think about strong subadditivity. So okay, maybe there's some setup like this that um, relates to that, that transition. Um, yeah, and then in, in commenting on like thinking operationally in general, um, I think for me, I, you know, I think about this operational setting as, as sort of just a, a linguistic crutch. Like it's just useful to think about Alice and Bob and, and, and Handy to talk that way. But, you know, I'm letting Alice do anything that's possible within the realm, within the laws of, of, of physics. So when I say, you know, Alice can do this, Alice can do that. I mean, like the laws of physics permit this to happen or this not to happen. So in, in that way, you, they're, they're not really like practical statements. They're, they're fundamental statements. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, um, Iden. So, hey, Alexa, let me uh, continue first to echo the praise for your uh, fantastic talk. It's can you turn up your volume? Oh, um, is that better? Okay. Uh, I can I'll just lean in. Go ahead. I stopped my video and I uh, lean in real close to my microphone. All right, just go, go ahead, ask yourself. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so actually I want to ask a little bit more about this thought number one 
And uh, could I also think about this as, um, or could you use this to, um, to, uh, to decide something about like what sorts of entanglement uh, you'd need in order to have like good holographic correspondence? Because like, so like, so correct me if I'm wrong, but like to, to run this protocol, um, like you need to have bell pairs shared between like these points C1 and C2, right? Yeah. So could I view this as making a statement about like okay, if if I want there to be some like dual box space time, there has to be. Um, there has to be like distillable entanglement that the state uh, in the state that uh, that's describing this uh, putative bulk dual. Yeah, yeah. So you're you're getting at this sort of historical development of this. So you know, originally I, I observed that this felt like holography a little bit, and then tried to turn that feeling into a, a, a real theorem or a real result, and. Um, was thinking along your lines and basically was led to this connected wedge theorem. So, so this is really what the connected wedge theorem says, right? It says um, when you have this holographic setup, there's some uh, requirements are entang on entanglement are set in your in your boundary. Um, you mentioned distillable entanglement. I, I don't know how to, to prove something about that, but I ended up proving something about the mutual information instead. Uh, yeah. All right. Um, Amukan. I thought Edward was before me, but uh, oh, okay. let me know. All right, well then, Edward. Amukan, go ahead, since you were called first. Thanks, Edward. Um, uh, Alex, uh, I had a question that was that uh, more like a comment that relates to what Henry and uh, Alex Bellion said. Um, to me, uh, the bulk causal structure is is sort of fine in the semi-classical limit, but it's it's sort of it's strongly constrained by what the boundary causal structure is. So if you think of you know going away from the large end limit, then all you really have is the boundary causal structure. You don't really have right. an intrinsic notion of bulk causal structure. Um, so while I appreciate the sort of the, the 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 mileage one gets by doing semi-classical analysis in the bulk. Um, I, I think the, the real crux is what kind of tasks can one do in quantum field theory that relate to these kind of summoning questions. And I don't know if you have thoughts about that. Uh, and I haven't seen a good discussion about quantum field theoretic interpretation of summoning tasks in quantum information. Oh, are you, sorry, are you, are you saying summoning tasks like this one I mentioned at the beginning or? At the, at the beginning, yeah. Or, or a, in general, any, anything that you've talked about, but. Yeah. yeah, just away from, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, that's a good point. Like, I guess, um, yeah, I'm definitely thinking in the, like G Newton goes to zero limit here. Um, and it would be interesting to ask, you know, away from that limit, can I, can I um, make more precise sense of this theorem? Um, but yeah, I guess, I don't know. I just, I guess I'll just say that's an interesting comment and I'm, Otherwise, not sure what to uh, how, how that will play out in the future. Yeah. All right. Uh, la uh, last but not least, uh, Edward. Oh well, I just want to comment briefly on one of the previous questions, which was why holography was essential in this discussion. I thought the answer was simply that if we were just doing conventional quantum field theory without an assumption of holography, we'd have no reason to predict that the task, which is trivial when you have access to the bulk can actually be solved purely on the boundary. I'm just repeating a small part of what Alex said in the talk, but I thought that was meant to be responsive to that particular question. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that comment. Okay, all right. Well, well does, does, does anyone else uh, now have a question or maybe a, a last thing? Yeah, I have, I have um, a question about the point two. So um, you said that when you allow the task to become uh, very complicated. Mm -hmm. that, um, so th in these discussions of um, complexity and so on, it, it was found that when the task becomes very complicated, you create some uh, space time or the space time becomes bigger. And that, for example, was applied to understand the interior of black holes, et cetera. Right. That, that makes me think that perhaps if this uh, channel end that you have in the middle is yeah. very complicated, then you might not be able to fit it in a small space-time region. Yeah, I think, I think that's a, an excellent point. And um, one I, I'm still continuing to think about. So 
you know, I think thinking about things like that that might come up, we might get a more refined statement about what exactly ADS CFT is, is telling us should be possible in terms of linear protocols. Um, I will say that the, the way this works is, I guess I was using complicated like colloquially and not in the circuit depth kind of sense. So um, anytime the, say, let's just say this is a unitary here. Anytime that is outside of the Clifford group, so it could be a very low depth um, okay. unitary. Anytime it's outside the Clifford group, then it's not clear uh, how to do this linearly. And so even in, in like, so maybe a more refined statement coming from this would be that, you know, low depth circuits that I can fit inside of this region should be possible to do linearly. Um, and then, you know, maybe still like very complex in the precise sense, uh, unitaries would still re require exponential entanglement. Th that could be allowed by this, this argument. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And a uh, uh, very last question, uh, Horacio. Yes, my question is, uh, this geometric theorem is not if and only if, right? Oh, yes, that's right. So I, I, I forgot to mention that. Um, but then the question is, uh, if you have a connected uh, minimal surface, you have enough entanglement, why is that you, what, what, what is happening in the bulk? Because you, you can do the protocol, right? But then you cannot do it classically in the, in the bulk somehow. That's well, you, you don't know that you can do the protocol. You just know that the mutual information is large enough that you could do it. But it could be that, I don't know, this probably isn't the case, but it could be something like that mutual information is in that case measuring a classical correlation. And then that classical correlation isn't sufficient to do the task in the, in the boundary. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's interesting why it, why it should go one way, but um, it, there's not really a good argument that like when this surface gets connected and the mutual information becomes large, that that then implies you should be able to do it. Um, and so, so the one wayness may be coming from from there. Or maybe you can do other things in the bulk, like uh, also using entanglement in the bulk or something like that. Can yes, yes, that that might be possible as well. Yeah. Well, um, all right. Well, I think let's uh, let, let's stop here. But uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, uh, um, awesome talk and awesome discussion. Thanks. Yeah. So just uh, yeah.